Hello, welcome to the Geneva Macolabs podcast series, Voices for Impact. My name is Marin Scholling, and I have the pleasure of being one of the co-founders of Geneva Impact. And I also serve our think and do tank, the Geneva Macolabs, as its head of stakeholder engagement. I'm very pleased to welcome, alongside my colleague, Renate Günther, Vice President of our Think and Do Tank, our distinguished guest, Dr. Robin Daniels, who is the board director, chief operating officer, and deputy chairman at the Amazon Protection Foundation. Welcome, Robin and Renate. Today, we will continue our conversation around valuing natural capital, and we will look at carbon sequestration in the context of climate change. Robin, you serve on various boards. You are a TEDx speaker, and primarily, you are interested in rapid business growth uh, paired with innovation and investment opportunities that allow to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, your non-for-profit foundation, the Amazon Protection Foundation, is headed by a world-leading board of environmentalists, innovators, and ambassadors. And together, I understand, um, you are trying to make a bold vision reality. For the next 30 years, you aim to protect 5 million hectares of native forests, that's about um, 12 million acres, to combat climate change. Now, the idea behind this, if I can summarize it, making climate change and carbon sequestration part of the same equation. And lately, we heard a lot about carbon sequestration, but how does this relationship between carbon sequestration and efforts to restore our planet's ecosystem work? What is it? And could you tell us what role does it play? So thanks, thanks for the opportunity to speak and join you. Um, well, carbon sequestration, we hear a lot about it in the news. And of course, over the last uh, two or three years, uh, it's been more and more discussed uh, in various formats. And, and actually, the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has kind of increased the general public awareness of the importance of outside and the green space and so on. Very recently, we've had the latest IPCC report um, about uh, the need to move very quickly, as quickly as possible, to a, a zero carbon economy around the world, which throws up lots of challenges. And carbon sequestration is often cited as, as the key uh, ingredient. Carbon sequestration, very basically, is simply the absorption of carbon from the atmosphere or carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and its storage through natural processes. So typically that can be um, through uh, the ex ex protecting existing forests, for example, or seagrass or other natural environments, not, not only rainforests around the world. Equally, soils are a really important absorber and storage process for carbon. Uh, and of course, that's what's led us on to, to carbon credits and a carbon marketplace, which we'll, I think we'll come on to in a, in a minute. Um, but it's only half the equation. One of the big challenges with carbon sequestration is that the Earth has a finite capacity for absorbing carbon. It can only do so much. And if you look at the statistics of how much human activity is leading to the emission of carbon and that carbon in the atmosphere, um, then we have to do something else. And the other side of the equation is, is clearly reducing carbon emissions very significantly uh, and very quickly. And uh, that's about looking at uh, manufacturing and transport and shipping. Cities are incredibly important. Within 20 or 30 years, more than half the global population will be in cities. So in many ways, the battle against climate change will be won or lost in our cities around the world, which presents many, many other challenges. Not least is the, uh, the, the so-called North-South divide or the developing versus the developed world divide where countries who are quickly developing quite rightly um, expect to achieve the same standards of living that they see in more developed countries. But what we have to do is decouple um, population growth and the growth of cities from damage to the climate and the environment. And so carbon sequestration is a, is a key component in that toolkit of approaches, but it's only part of it. It's only one element of, of the things we need to think about. Thank you, uh, Robin. Now, taking all these elements together that you just have mentioned, I would even say that only a system solution which rewards positive action can be sustainable, right? Rather than punishing action that we don't uh, need for the same future, we would 
uh, look into how we can reward positive action. Now, what do you think, how can we best prevent and reverse the um, degradation of our global ecosystem? You already mentioned um, some fraction between South and North, but what can we actually do about it? The first priority has to be um, reducing uh, the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, but I think really important is this idea of reward that you mentioned. Um, there's a sense sometimes, I think, for, for everyone when they see the news and they see what's happening with the environment, that it, it might appear just to be too much of a problem. It's a huge problem. It's kind of an existential threat out there. And what can individuals do about that uh, is a really important question. Now, I'm, I'm particularly fortunate because I'm in a position where I'm working with really talented people on addressing some of these challenges directly. Uh, and there are more and more people engaged and focused on this. And encouragingly, I see uh, younger people coming out of college, coming out of university, seeing this as not only a great career opportunity, which it clearly is, but also something that they, they kind of feel in here. It's, it's, you know, it's something they want to, to do. So the most important thing is that collectively we recognize that things need to change now. This is on our watch and it's our responsibility to make a change. And that can be at a very individual, personal level, thinking about uh, lifestyle and what you consume and how you travel and all those things that we increasingly are well understood but also at the other end of the spectrum, doing what we can to influence politicians and large business in particular. In the end, my belief is that the solution will be, will come from the private sector. It will be, there will be commercial solutions that, that close the loop uh, between the need to um, invest in ways to improve the environment and reduce emissions um, and an opportunity to make money from it. Because only only solutions that are sustainable financially and economically and commercially will be sustainable at all in the end. And then at some point, hopefully governments will catch up and tax, tax uh, uh, incentives and policies will become aligned behind this. But we cannot wait for governments to change legislation before we start taking action. Exactly. Everybody has to take its place. So, Robin, you work in different parts of the world and you are involved in quite a number of organizations that aims to deliver and change for a polluted, unbalanced, unequal world. Could you tell us about any practical examples of that kind of joint uh, approach? Sure. Well, Mariana at the beginning mentioned um, the Amazon Protection Foundation, um, which is the, the uh, a project that I've been very closely involved with for a number of years now. It was the foundation, which is a US foundation, was established by the Brazilian Rainforest Conservation Company, um, EBCF. And EBCF owns uh, the first um, certified private reserve uh, in the Amazon, fully certified by the Amazonas and Brazilian governments. Um, and our core objective there is to um, build and develop new models that um, make it uh, basically make it more profitable to conserve the rainforest and the communities who are living there and give them new opportunities than it is to allow it to be cut down uh, or for mining or deforestation. Um, the first focus of our activity is on the is on the harvesting and sale internationally of non-timber products, nuts, berries, fruits and so on which are harvested locally by communities and cooperatives. Um, and, then, uh, and then we're working hard to establish sustainable supply chains to, to, uh, to uh, help to increase those commercial opportunities. But the revenues from that kind of activity, although it's incredibly important, are very small compared to the revenues that you might expect for commercial logging or mining, for example, even though it can be just a one hit uh, income. So we have to close the gap between relatively modest revenues from those kinds of activities and the much higher short term and very destructive income or revenues or opportunities that, that come from deforestation and, uh, and mining and, and that kind of activity. And so we have built on that basis a number of other activities uh, which really focus on the idea of creating a number of protected reserves uh, in the Amazon and expanding the, the footprint that we have 
we, we currently have about 20,000 hectares, and as, as Marianne said, we're expanding that significantly at the moment and in future years. Um, carbon credits is, is a component of that as well. So the, the reserve is, is fully certified and we, we, uh, there's, a, there's a periodic verification process that has to take place and so on. Um, but we're also very interested in science and technology and innovation and using the reserve as a way to better understand the flora and fauna of the rainforest in a way that both um, gives us a better understanding of its health and how it's developing and what the threats to it might be, but also to recognize that there are huge undiscovered uh, medical therapies or other, uh, other benefits from the rainforest that, other, that if the rainforest goes, are lost forever. Um, and so it's a combination of things, which, and these activities are based around four pillars from our point of view, of environmental, uh, climatic, social, and economic or financial. Uh, and what's critically important is this approach, this systems approach, we think, so that it's not just carbon, carbon is important, carbon sequestration is an element. Um, uh, economic and financial solutions are an important element. The uh, 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 sustainability and conservation are a key element, but really it all has to come together as a coherent package. And at the heart of it are the people living there. So in the, uh, in the reserve as it stands at the moment, are about 30,000 families working and living uh, there, and they have to be part of the solution because if they're not part of the solution, then uh, we're never going to achieve anything. It has to, it has to be owned, truly owned, legitimately and demonstrably owned and driven uh, by the people who are living in these communities because they're a fundamental part of the solution. So I think it's a case of bringing together this combination of people, planet and profit in a, yeah. in a coherent manner. <laughs> uh, and, and particularly as um, the, the approach to decarbonization and the approach to fi fighting the climate crisis becomes more sophisticated and investors become more sophisticated, they will increasingly see that if it's going to be replicable, if a solution is going to be replicable, and scalable and sustainable in every way, then it has to be a systems solution that takes account of all these variables. Exactly. So maybe can you wrap up again what, what makes um, your work a good example for sustainable finance? You already mentioned it uh, <clears throat> before, yeah. but just to, to wrap it up. So it's I think it's I think it's a really good example because we actually recognize that finance is is a really key lever to pull. Um, if it's if the solution, as I mentioned before, the solution isn't sustainable, whatever solution it is financially, then it won't be solution a solution at all. It won't be sustainable. Um, and so what we have uh, in the uh, in the EBTF project in the rainforest is the um, is the basis of non timber. Uh, harvesting and sales, which on its own turns a profit, and and profits from that go directly back into social projects in the community. So, uh, and they can be very basic projects, uh, improving uh, improving housing, sanitation, water quality, and so on. Um, educational opportunities for the young people are incredibly important. So that's a really big priority for us: health and well-being. Uh, gender equality, equality of opportunity for the, within the communities. So we plow all that straight back in. So that, all, that already creates a, a virtuous circle between a commercial activity where everyone is involved and social cohesion and strength and, uh, and so on. And that's the model that we replicate in all of these other activities. So even when we start to think about the application of technologies uh, we're developing the idea of a, a digital twin for natural assets, for example, and the use of robotics and artificial intelligence and so on. Um, we're really keen that that all is understood and owned and developed in the reserve by the people uh, involved there, because it really opens up lots of new opportunities, uh, not only for them personally, but for us to collectively to come up with more coherent solutions. So the EBCF project is really the, the most, or certainly one of the most mature approaches to this whole challenge, certainly that I, I've seen. Um, that's partly because um, 
my colleagues who've been involved much longer than I have have been doing this for a long time, sort of 15 or 20 years. This isn't a, a new thing. This is a life's work for a lot of the people involved. And that's another important message, I think, is that um, we have to act quickly and with, with, uh, you know, uh, and with, uh, with determination. But these things take perseverance. And there are many, many obstacles and many challenges uh, in terms of what we're what we're doing, but I think the EBCF model and the work of the Amazon Protection Foundation in connecting up people, planet, and profit in a coherent, virtuous circle uh, is really has to be at the core of it. That's the DNA that runs through everything that we that we do. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Robin. I just wanted to take a deeper look into the carbon market before we close um, our conversation today. Um, you are somebody um, who is focusing a lot on the environmentally sensitive application of technology. And you just have mentioned how you're doing that with, with your foundation. You also look into new business models to drive innovation and investment into the global fight against climate change, social inequality, and also habitat loss. You've mentioned some of the key challenges in the future and also some opportunities to battle against climate change. But if we take a glimpse into um, the, the challenge that many times uh, in, 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 in this uh, realm, there is this, uh, this challenge of, of greenwashing of our organizations. Um, how do you encounter those statements where there is hesitation that such an approach really works in, 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 in our current system? It's a it's a really good question, and it and it's becoming increasingly important. Uh, we 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 can't in the medium and long term have any kind of solution where the dirtiest companies or countries with the biggest budgets can find themselves out of polluting practices and the damage they continue to do. Um, and so, in many ways, there's a there's a very strong argument that net zero, which is all over the news, isn't enough because it becomes diluted. And, and it opens, it, it's open to interpretation in too many ways. Absolute zero uh, carbon is a difficult challenge, but I think it would be a healthier, you know, you, you aim, aim for the stars and maybe you hit the moon. You know, it would be a healthier, audacious uh, project to uh, target to have. I, th I think another challenge that we need to think about is saying you know, for countries to say that we're going to be 100% renewable or zero carbon by 2030 or 2040 or 2050, um, that's not going to work. Where are the intermediate targets? What are you going to do today? Where are you going to be in six months? Where are you going to be in uh, a year? Uh, so intermediate targets on the journey, I think, are, are, are crucial, and we just don't see that at the moment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion around carbon credits, UBCF, sell carbon credits in the market. Is, is that a healthy thing? Um, I think we're on a journey. I think where we are at the moment, the sale of carbon credits to offset carbon emissions elsewhere is a useful tool, but it can't be used in the way that it is now forever. There will always be a place for carbon credits. The, the advantage of having a market in carbon is that the more and more trade that happens, the price of carbon per tonne increases. So if you're a corporate and you're buying carbon to offset your emissions and the price is going up and up, at some point you're going to say, hang on, for this money we're spending on carbon, we could invest that in technology to reduce our emissions in the first place. And we start to see that tipping point being approached. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as long as people are very clear eyed about the impact and the, the economic uh, impact and changes in people's behavior that are being propagated by carbon credits in the carbon market, then um, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, the other important challenge is going to be for, for companies and organizations involved in it is that, is that uh, investors and, and philanthropists are going to become more and more sophisticated in terms of understanding the impact that their investment or their donation is having. They're gonna to want to know that their dollar is not only having the impact or the effect that they wanted it to have, but um, as importantly, if not more importantly, there aren't unintended consequences of that external third party impact mm -hmm. in, in, in that kind of environment, wherever it is. Uh, and so measurement reporting and verification of what's happening is going to become much more sophisticated. 
And I think technology has a big role to play in that, the use of blockchain, of tokenization and cryptocurrencies, of these emerging tools are going to be um, particularly important when it comes to that uh, and will be a challenge for those who attempt greenwashing or superficial uh, activity because the serious guys and girls are going to be really drilling into what these projects are and the impact they're having and what their investment is going to do for them. And that's going to be a very hard-nosed commercial financial process. It's not <laughs> about hugging trees. It, you know, it, it's not about saving the planet, even at that level. It's about, is my investment having the impact I want it to have? So it's very important to, to marry that kind of you know, big finance, financial engineering view of the world with people in communities who are living this reality day to day and will be those first affected by the impact of climate change. And that holistic approach and that joined up model, I, I think, is it has to be the way forward. Wonderful, Robin. As a stakeholder engagement um, head, uh, this is just the uh, uh, music in my ears, as we say in German. Thank you for um, this great final statement. And you've shown that um, having a systemic uh, understanding of how these different elements work together helps us to not only look into um, very uh, fractured um, ideas of, of, of the carbon uh, market, but looking um, into the different correlations that uh, are driving uh, the development of, of, of uh, this very specific uh, way to um, combat climate change. Thank you so much for your deliberations, for your thoughts, for this conversation. Thank you also, Renata, uh, being my, my uh, co-moderator. And uh, we would like to thank also the audience for listening to our video podcast. And uh, we would like um, all of you to uh, have a look at our campaign and the website. We are working on a very interesting uh, project that kind of um, uses um, such a systemic approach that you, Robin, um, just described. And we also invite everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel where lots of more interesting conversations can be found. Thank you so much and have a good day.